The Dragon Prince as a show is fundamentally more serialized than Avatar The Last Airbender or even The Legend of Korra. Whereas those shows have distinct episodes that can be viewed from a self-contained perspective and tell their own concise stories, the episodes in The Dragon Prince are merely like chapters in a book. They are segments of the narrative that do not particularly work well when viewed in isolation without the context of the greater series. And yet, what I would consider the best episode of the show, its most incisive and poignant, is the episode that, I believe out of all the episodes in the show, does work the best when viewed from a more episodic perspective. It is essentially a part of the Dragon Prince, of course, and should be viewed inside that context, but it is organic in a Schopenhauerian sense. It belongs to the whole, but it is its own distinct part. And when viewed outside merely the linear progression of going through the series, it has its own distinct identity and its own distinct role to play in establishing the characters, ideas, and themes of the show that make it an episode worth constantly coming back to, aside merely from its function in progressing the narrative. One could even view this in a Darwinian sense. Think of species and ecology as a whole. There are specific species, but they are not completely distinguished from the ecosystem as a whole. They are inevitably blurring together. They inevitably come from similar roots, and depending on the historical context and environmental context in which they occur, they become different. They are not to be viewed in isolation, even as they are inevitably a part of the greater whole. This is, I believe, what comes of the best blend of episodic and serialized storytelling, and that is what this, Thunderfall, the darkest and most daring episode of the Dragon Prince, does so well. But enough high-minded theorizing. Despite how well the episode works, both as its own isolated, self-contained world and in the function of clarifying a lot of tensions and anxieties and conflicts that had hitherto remained vague, the episode is just phenomenally constructed. It is told from two different perspectives that parallel each other without becoming too overt or needlessly baroque in these parallels. One of the halves of the episode is from the perspective of Rayla, Callum, and Ezrin. They are anxious and worried, preparing for the final confrontation with Viren and his forces. Fifi, their trusted and reliable phoenix, dies abruptly, and as they progress on their journey, they come across the petrified body of Thunder Avizandum, the noble, terrifying king of the dragons. And Callum relates his ambivalence to being by Thunder Avizandum. He deeply loved his mother, and he understands that desire to avenge her, and he is not breaking down in tears that Thunder Avizandum is gone, but he also recognizes that Thunder Avizandum was the father of Zim, and he understands that the death of Thunder Avizandum ultimately led to more conflict and more instability. He openly admits that he's not sure how he should feel, and in a show that too often relies on rather reductive 
moral precepts despite all its abstract ideological gestures at more complex views of characters and greater sociopolitical dynamics. Such an expression of ambivalence is quite welcome. It's quite liberating, actually. It's a sort of freedom from conventionality, from banal reassurance. It's an invitation to open reflection, the free play of the mind outside of simple ideological categories. But this side of the episode only has so much weight because Viren's side is devoted to detailing what happened before that point, how the death of Thunder Avizandum came about, with Viren impassioned with extreme but still quite earnest idealism, wanting to help Harrow avenge Sarai's death and kill Thunder Avizandum with his magic schemes. Harrow, heartbroken and somber, agrees. And the two of them ride off on a bleak, desolate quest to kill the king. The lands through which they ride are barren and desolate. A stark contrast from the worlds of life and vivacity and bright colors that so often characterize the experience of watching the Dragon Prince. The scenes here are sober. They're austere. They're almost stylized in a way in how they convey that sense of the complete ceasing of all action, all vitality, all forms of hope and optimism and passionate, vibrant aspirations for the future. It's all dark and elegiac. And ultimately, though, Viren succeeds at convincing Harrow and Thunder Falls, the path that Viren chose then led him to being where he is now, alone, isolated from his family, from any firm foundation of morality or any reasonable ambition or plans for the future, instead being so consumed by his desperate obsession with Erevas, steadily losing his mind to this darkly macabre puppet master. In Viren's flashbacks, the strings vibrate and strum. And yet the sound mix is unusually spacious and capacious. There's not a lot of frenetic activity going on here outside the conflict with Thunder. This is a catastrophic and fundamentally epic-altering scenario, uprooting the foundations on which the elves and dragons have relied for so long. It's not a joyous time, and it fundamentally led Viren into the fatalistic situation in which he has found himself. There are a few times in The Dragon Prince when it dares to undermine and uproot this triumphalist idealism that runs through it. Yes, The Dragon Prince gestures at unmaking a lot of these simplistic and naive resolutions that everything is going to be perfect, that everything is going to be idyllic. But, like Avatar The Last Airbender, the show is ultimately optimistic, even in Season 4. Arguably its bleakest season yet. The Luxoria plotline is a great example of this fundamental ambivalence in the show to the idea of 
challenging the heartfelt, ultimately optimistic view of the future that runs through the show. Janai and Amaya have a rather simplified and rather reductive view of how the blurring of the lines between elves and humans is going to work, and how their own marriage is going to be received. Kareem offers a counterexample to their bombastic effervescent idealism, and he makes quite a compelling case demonstrating the destruction and the harm to the cultural and ritualistic foundations of Lexoria that can result from such abrupt intermixing of these cultures. He argues strongly for his position, and Janai and Amaya make quite a few mistakes. And yet, ultimately, this struggle is able to be resolved. Kareem loses all support by the end of the season. Janai and Amaya lead Luxoria toward the future. It's sweet, and it's nuanced enough that I do not have a problem with this kind of resolution, but it is something fundamentally different from what's happening in Thunderfall. Sure, in Thunderfall we do have this final affirmation of the potential for a more harmonious and peaceful future. Rayla gives a sweet, tender-hearted speech about the possibilities that await elves and humans. And we get a lovely image of Ezrin and Zim, the sons of the Conqueror and the Conquered, playfully enjoying themselves. And yet, this is not an absolute declaration that we, the viewers, are invited to necessarily share wholeheartedly. It's potential. And that's good, but that's all it is. It does not necessarily translate to a perfect, pristine future. Rayla herself being the one to make this proclamation is a bit ironic in retrospect, considering that she is the one to leave Callum, undermining, in particular, their relationship, which devastates Callum, but also, in a more general sense, the possibility for elves and humans to easily acclimate to a harmonious and prosperous future. There are not any solutions, hard or easy, that will solve every problem that faces the elves and the humans. This is not a luxurious situation where the tensions can be resolved with much effort and enthusiasm and determination. There is a fundamental sense of ambiguity and uncertainty regarding whether these tensions can be fixed at all. Certainly they can be helped to heal, and there can be a hope of a brighter future. But making the right choices, being this technocratic wizard, is not going to magically heal these deep and somber rifts. Only time can do that, and it doesn't do so by simply patching back together the world as it was before the rifts between humans and elves started, but it can only do so by creating a new world, and that is both exciting and scary. It is a fundamental break from the old, and there's no absolute promise that the new world is going to be perfect, or that it's going to be fundamentally clear and beautiful and harmonious. It's simply potential. Thunderfall ends on ambiguity and a distinct lack of catharsis. There is a sense of hope for the future, but that's all it is. Hope. So thank you all for watching. If you like what you saw today, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Don't to my Patreon if you can and you want to see more videos like this. 
I have been wanting to make a video about Thunderfall, an episode I deeply love, for quite a long time. I figured that right after Season 4 would be the perfect time. Tune in soon for next analysis. It will be coming soon. I promise you that. Thank you all again. Adios, comrades.